okay and starting in three two one okay everyone welcome uh, this is ted baker chief inspector of hospitals with the latest of our strategy webinars we're looking at developing our strategy to launch in the spring of next year and thank you very much for joining me today uh, to contribute to this webinar. I'll be describing on, on our, thinking, uh, our thinking so far uh, and uh, opening it up for questions, comments or suggestions from you uh, in, in due course. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your views. The, the overall uh, working title of our strategy at the moment is Smarter Regulation for a Safer Future. And I'll try and explain what we're thinking about there, looking at the bigger strategy picture, but focusing down on one of our four strategic themes, which is promoting safe care for people. And that's going to be the focus of what we discussed today, although I'll try and give you the context of the wider strategy so you can see the thinking about safety within the wider context as we go forward. OK, so next slide, please. Well, first of all, I just want a, a big thank you and welcome to the, the team of colleagues from CQC who are joining me on the call today. And they'll be here to help with the logistics, but also help me answer any of the questions or, or, and take away any comments that you have, because uh, we'll try and answer any questions you raise. But of course, there may be more than we can answer during this session. And if so, we'll take them away and try and respond to you or, or talk to you outside if, if there are issues you want to raise with us uh, 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 later on. So thank you very much for the contribution and thank you to colleagues. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Right, this is this is our, our, our structure for the for, for the webinar. Uh, we will stick to an hour, so we'll be finishing at three o'clock on the dot and this webinar is being recorded just for your information. Uh, only the people from the CQC will be able to speak on, on the webinar, so you won't be able to give verbal feedback, but there is a chat uh, session, so please do use it for feedback, comments or questions. Please put your name to the comments or questions, one, so we know who we're talking to, but also so if necessary, we can follow it up with you directly afterwards, because there may be things we can't take forward during this session, which we want to follow up with individuals on the call. So please do give us your name and, uh, and make sure that we can contact you afterwards. If anyone wants to raise a question or an issue that isn't directly relevant to the, uh, the uh, subject of the, of the webinar, that's fine, but we won't deal with it during the webinar. We'll, we'll come back to you after the event because we don't want to get sidetracked into other areas. And then we know there's always so much people want to discuss. So, so we'll start talking about our purpose and vision as CQC, just to put this in context uh, and the vision for what we're trying to achieve with our strategy. I'll say a bit about learning from the, the, the pandemic because we live in very difficult times at the moment. We live in very challenging times, but we live in times that there's great potential for learning. And while this, this pandemic has come in the middle of our strategy development, uh, there really is an opportunity to take away the learning from, from what has happened during the pandemic and take that forward. And I'll touch on that and I'll be very interested to get your thoughts and comments on that where, where you think they might be helpful. I'll talk about the process and how we will change and the timeline of change and, and just to make it clear so you can understand where we are in the strategic process and then I'll zero in on the on the theme the strategic theme that we're focusing on today and that is promoting safe care for people and that will be the main purpose of the webinar and that's what I'm really interested in hearing your views about. Once I've described where we think we are on that, our thinking on, on, on safe care, it'll be great to hear your comments or questions and that, that there'll be a break for that, uh, an opportunity to ask, ask questions at that stage. Then I'll just briefly describe uh, how we how you can stay up to date with our strategy development because we're very much in the mid mid range of our strategy development. There'll be lots more opportunities to to contribute on this theme or on our other themes and I'm very keen that you should stay up to date with that. I'll, I'll explain that to you and right at the end, depending on how much time we've got, we'll open it up to more questions and answers. So that's our timetable for today. So thank you very much for, for that slide. Let's go on to the next one, please. Right, so the purpose of the CQC, and I suppose the important thing to say about our purpose is this strategy is not changing our purpose. Our purpose is what it has always been. Uh, we, we are here to make sure health and social care services provide people with safe, effective, compassionate, high quality care, and we encourage services to improve. Now that last phrase there, we encourage services to improve, is a very important one for us 
and it is one that we are focusing on heavily during this strategy. In fact, the, reg the, the, the legislation that originally set up the CQC very clearly said its primary purpose was to encourage services to improve. So it is very central to our role. Uh, and we're not here just to regulate for the sake of telling people things they can't do. We want to be a regulator that really helps people improve their services. And, and that is a strong theme in this strategy and we'll come back to it as we go through the talk today. So, so that's our purpose, it hasn't changed. The vision for this strategy is we want to be a world-class regulator. Now we need to define what world-class means, of course, and that again is a challenge for us. It's, it's an easy thing to say, but actually what does being a world-class regulator mean? We want to be able to drive improvements in how people experience care, uh, health and care services, working towards a safer future. So the vision is to be a world-class regulator, driving improvements in how people experience health and care services, working towards a safer future. And virtually every word in that vision counts because this is about people's experience. It is about safety. It is about driving improvement. And it is about the quality of us as a regulator in, in using regulation effectively. And so that's that's really central to our strategy going forward. Next slide, please. So uh, the context of this is that is that that the uh, uh, the world in which we regulate is changing. And you know that as well as we do. Uh, and that change appears to be speeding up. And to some extent, that change has sped up even more because of the pandemic we've all been living through over the last few months. Uh, things had to change very quickly by force of circumstance. But equally, even before that, things were changing uh, quite significantly going forward. For instance, uh, we know, uh, well, we judge, our, we judge our, our effectiveness as a regulator by the quality of the services we regulate. Uh, so it's no good being a brilliant regulator while the services uh, that we regulate are not very good. We want those services to be as good as they can possibly be. So how do we challenge ourselves as a regulator to do that? Well, at the moment, if, if we, there are problems in services, then clearly those services have a responsibility to sort them out. But we as a regulator, uh, we need to be part of helping them drive that improvement. And we know we don't always get that right at the moment. How can we use regulation more effectively uh, to, to drive improvement of services. We must also be more relevant and responsive. We, we don't be a regulator that gets in the way of innovation and change. New technologies coming in, uh, that technology needs to be used effectively and safely to make sure people get the care, care they need. We don't want to be as a regulator that gets in the way of technological change or other changes in services. Uh, services, uh, uh, there's much more talk of services being integrated into systems of care. Uh, but we are a regulator that in legislative terms is set up as a, as a regulator of individual providers of care. Again, another, another important part uh, of our vision going forward is how do we move to be looking at services from the perspective of the whole system of services across an area, a system or a pathway? Looking at services through the eyes of people receiving those services because people receiving services often do not receive services from an individual provider. They pre pre receive services from a series of providers working together. Uh, and how can we as a regulator make sure that that it works as well as possible for the people receiving services and understand their frustrations with the quality of care from the system they receive it, even if they may not be getting, even if they're getting really good quality care from individual parts of the system. Uh, so we need to be able to change as the system changes. We need to be able to change as people's needs changes and we need to be able to change as technology drives change. And so that is the context in which we're developing this strategy. Next slide, please. So during the COVID pandemic, uh, during the, the, the peak of the COVID pandemic, we paused routine inspections uh, because clearly we didn't want to add to the burden and add to the risk. Uh, during the, the, the height of the pandemic. But we didn't take our eye off looking to, at care to make sure it was safe and that treatment was effective. We didn't want to stand back from safety at the heart of this. And so we continued responsive inspections and we've continued to take enforcement action in some circumstances, although less than normal because we recognise services are under enormous pressure. We also used technological uh, uh, developments to develop what we call the emergency support framework. And this was a way of communicating with providers about their experience of operating during the COVID epidemic and understanding what the challenges they faced. And wherever possible, 
providing support and encouragement for them by perhaps by putting them in touch with other services that could give them support during the COVID uh, pandemic. It helps us understand the risk in the system, but also we help help helps support the system. And we've been reporting what, was, what we've been finding in the emergency support framework, in our communication with providers, in regular uh, insight reports that we're publishing on, on a monthly basis. And we can going to continue to publish those over the next few, few months. So we've changed very much our approach to inspections uh, and to regulation during the COVID-19 epidemic. But we do realise that we need to go back to a planned programme of routine inspections in due course. At the moment, we're doing work on developing that, but it will not be going back to what we're doing at the start of the pandemic. We want to we want to make sure that our approach going forward is proportionate and responsive and wherever possible, supportive of services under pressure. Next slide, please. There are some important things that we think that, that, that are important to learn from the COVID crisis. Uh, one of the things that's really come very clear to us is one, and I've talked to, to uh, about how we've communicated and worked with providers. We've got to listen to care providers and her, understand the pressures they are under, but we've also got to listen and see care through the eyes of people using services. Uh, and that has become very clear to us and is a strong theme throughout this webinar. I'll come back to it uh, several times again in the future. So we've got to, I think it's important learning from this is that we need to understand care from the point of view of providers, but also the view of people using services. But also what is important is about sharing information and transparency. And I think one of the things that's been frustrating at times during the COVID-19 epidemic is that actually getting hold of the information has been difficult. Sometimes that's because the information wasn't available, but sometimes that's because the system doesn't naturally want to share information. And sharing information, making it open and transparency about what is going on, we think are really very important points that we've learned from this, this, this uh, uh, pandemic. And going forward, we want to be strong advocates of openness about information and transparency about what is going on in the system. Transparency sometimes is challenging because clearly there are problems there, but actually if you don't face up to the problems, we will never deal with them. And I think we as a regulator want to be a strong advocate of transparency going forward. The other thing that I think has come out of it is, the, is coming back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, and that is the importance of local systems working together. Uh, and we've seen that, that where systems have worked together, they've been able to respond better to the COVID-19 epidemic than some other systems that haven't. And because of that, we've launched a programme of what we're calling provider collaboration reviews, which launched last week and is going to continue over the next few weeks, looking at 11, 11 areas throughout England to understand how providers have collaborated effectively during the COVID epidemic to provide joined up care. And what we want to extract from that is some really understanding what good practice looks like. And we'll be exploring with providers in systems throughout England about what good practice looks like in providing joined up care across systems. We'll be publishing a report on that in, in, in our insight report in September of this year. Uh, and we very much hope that the learning from that will be used going forward, both in terms of taking health and care services integration further forward in the future, but also in continuing the response to the COVID pandemic going into the winter when we may face new challenges. So we think that learning about how local systems work together has proved very important and we are determined to, to learn from that ourselves, but also to help, help providers learn from that as well. Next slide, please. So to get back to the strategy itself and a focus on the strategy, uh, how are we planning to change? Well, there are four emerging strategic themes we've developed so far in our consultation with stakeholders, with people using services and internally within the CQC. And these are four themes as they stand at the moment. First of all, meeting people's needs. And this very much comes back to our saying a few minutes ago, it is about seeing care through the eyes of people using services. It is understanding their needs through their experience uh, of care. Uh, and I think that is really very important for us going forward. And it's, as I said, I've said before, this is a constant theme I'll be coming back to. How do we see care through the, through the eyes of people using services? And it's gonna be very important in the safety uh, discussion we're gonna take place in a few minutes time. So we'll come back to that. Uh, there are perhaps two elements of meeting people's needs that are really going to be important in this. One is 
the system view that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, this understanding systems and making sure we support system integration. So care is built around the needs of people rather than around structures within the, within the, with the health and care infrastructure is really very important. And we want to understand how we can better do that as a regulator. The other aspect of care, and again, COVID has brought this to the fore, uh, but even before COVID brought it to the fore, we saw it as central to our strategy going forward. And that is understanding health inequalities and looking at quality of care, not just in terms of absolute quality of care, but actually how good is the care for everyone in the system? And how good is the care for the people who perhaps most disadvantaged in the system? And looking at looking at the outcomes across different parts of society and challenging providers and systems to make sure they're meeting the needs of everyone in the system, uh, 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 focusing on their individual or group needs. So health inequalities, I think, is going to be really important to us going forward. And that uh, is a real challenge and a different way of thinking for us as a regulator. The second theme is smarter regulation. And again, this has really two aspects to it. First of all, it's the better use of technology. And I, we've already started using technology in a different way in our emergency support framework. And what we've learned from that, we're going to apply into our wider regulation going forward. But there's much more to do. Uh, and in terms of how we use technology and move from what has been a very traditional paper based view of regulation to a very intelligent, technologically driven view of regulation, I think is going to be very different. That will make us very, very different in the way uh, we, we, we regulate, it will make us very different in the way we inspect or assess services, because we'll be doing it in, in, in a much more fleet of foot way. And uh, as of the meeting only a few minutes ago, we're talking to colleagues about how can we become a fleet of foot regulator. So that's part of smarter regulation, technologically driven. But also, smarter regulation is about the relationship. I've talked already about the relationship with people using services, very important. We need to listen to their voice much, much more clearly. That's smarter regulation. But we also need to develop a different relationship with people providing services, a relationship that is more a partnership rather than a kind of a, a, a client relationship that we have at the moment. So we want to move from what is a very traditional view of regulation to a very different view of regulation where regulator and provider are partners working together to provide high quality care for people using services. Clearly we have different roles uh, and the regulation role is very clear, but the fact you have different roles doesn't mean you can't work together uh, uh, supporting each other's, other's roles. And I think smarter regulation is about how we regulate and it is also about how we build really strong partnerships with people providing services. And again, I think that is going to be a challenge for us. And I think we need to work with you on developing that further. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about safe care. So I won't talk about the, the third theme there because we'll be coming back to it in detail. But the fourth theme, and I mentioned earlier on, that one of our key uh, roles as a, as a regulator is driving improvement. And I think one of the things we've learned over the last few years is that quality of care is not static. Quality of care, if it is any good, has to be continually improving. Uh, and I suppose there's a real sense, in, for instance, in my area in hospitals, the outstanding hospitals in the country, and there are increasing numbers of those, I should say, which, which is really good news. The outstanding hospitals are those that have got a really, really entrenched, embedded quality improvement culture, where every day they're looking to improve their services. So every day their services are getting better, they're getting safer than they were the day before. Uh, and, and building that quality improvement view of quality uh, is, I think, really very important in, in our driving improvement. So, so we want to understand how we as a regulator can import, can, can uh, support all services to, to embed quality improvement as part of their culture uh, uh, in the way they provide care. So driving and supporting improvement, again, very important to us in our themes, but it's promoting safe care for people that we'll be coming back to in a moment. And just on the right of the slide there, we recognise that this is not just about the, the providers changing, it is about us as a regulator changing. And we do not underestimate how much we as a regulator need to change. And I think our, 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 our strategy as it is today means that in five years time we'll be a very different organization. I've talked already about technology. I've talked already about 
changing the way we relate to providers and people using services. But that means we as an organization need to change. And, and some of the building blocks there on the right are the building blocks we'll use to transform ourselves uh, as a regulator going forward. Next slide, please. So timeline, where are we? Well, we're now at phase three. There you see at the top, we started uh, uh, developing our new strategy in the summer of 2019. Uh, and so we, we are just about halfway through developing the strategy. And that's where we are at the moment. There's still plenty of time to develop it further, which is why your input is really very important. But we've been doing a lot of thinking, consulting and discussing it up to now. Phase two was developing the draft priorities uh, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the internal developments of the organisation, and that that went on up till January of this year. And phase three, which uh, rolled out over the last few months, it, it, it is is has really been the, the 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 next stage of strategy development in the context of the pandemic, which of course uh, came came in March of this year. So there were an opportunity to test some of our strategic ideas in the developments of things like the emergency support framework. So while the emergency support framework was very much a response to the COVID pandemic, it is also a reflection of our strategic thinking going forward. Now, what we eventually develop as our methodology for assessing or, 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 or monitoring or inspecting services won't be the emergency support framework, but the thinking that went into it will be helped drive what we do. And I think that that sense of a, a supportive regulatory framework rather than a compliance driven framework is one we want to develop, but equally it needs to the rigor to make sure services are safe. And I think getting that right is what we are learning to do at the moment and what I'd like your feedback on today. So that's where we are at the moment. Uh, and that's what this webinar is about. As we go into the winter of this year, we'll undertake a formal consultation on the on the strategy uh, uh, and that will be really building on some of the strategic themes I'm talking about now. And as we go into uh, the spring of next year, 2021, we'll be publishing and launching our strategy with the implementation plan uh, and the work we're doing in telling the organisation to, de to deliver the strategy. OK, so next slide, please. So promoting safe care for people. Now, of course, safety has always been part of our uh, regulation up till now. So same, talking about promoting safety is not new. I think what we want to emphasize, though, is our thinking about safety is changing. Uh, as I say, I think we as a regulator have been seen to be a, a, a compliance driven, uh, tick box driven, if you like, and I'm sure some of you can can, can, can reflect that back. Uh, and what we want to do is understand how can we make a real difference to safety uh, it, it going forward. Uh, and we can't do that just by going and checking out that people are doing the things they ought to be doing in, in purely process terms. We need to ask the question behind that, what is driving them to do things the way they do? And this is about safety culture. And I think if you look at all those organisations that have really driven safety, it is not about process so much as culture. And how do we get the safety culture right? And how do we develop a universal safety culture across health and social care, making sure that the services are set up to deliver care in the safest way possible consistently? And they don't rely on secrecy inspectors to come around and check the fridge temperatures or whatever CQC inspectors do. They, they, the safety is, is just integral and built into the system and is, is part of everyone's expectation of how the care is provided. Now, when, when we were looking in hospitals uh, uh, 80 months or so ago into, into NEVER events, um, uh, people challenged us on this saying, but actually don't you realise shortage of resource, uh, pressure of work, uh, uh, there are, it is very difficult uh, under those pressures to consistently always deliver care as safely as we'd wanted to. Uh, and that is a very real concern, I think, of providers. But equally, I think we as a regulator want to challenge that. We want to say, actually, you know, whatever the circumstances, safety should always be top of the list. And it's been very interesting during the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, the, the, the sense that safety actually should be coming to the fore during the COVID-19 epidemic. And I've seen some really good work around that going on 
in some of the services I visited during the epidemic. So there's, there's a real sense that even under intense pressure, you can put safety first. And that is part of what we're talking about here. The expectation that, that safety will always be the top priority and people really mean that and deliver that. But that has to be part of the culture. We've talked here in some of the other aspects of safety that are really important. Speaking up, again, is really very important. And I suppose one of the concerns we have about health and social care is that speaking up cultures are very variable. And we still hear far too often the fact that, that staff feel reluctant to speak up because they feel they'll be blamed or, or there'll be uh, some uh, uh, just, uh, 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 detriment to them about speaking up. Uh, but equally, I think the culture in which they work doesn't encourage speaking up. Uh, often the culture is very hierarchical and for junior people to speak up is very difficult. It is very difficult because it is seen to be disruptive and not playing the game. Well, in actual fact, uh, it, speaking up should be seen as everyone's responsibility. How can we get to a culture where people are speaking up is welcomed because speaking up about safety concerns is what drives safety and consistent safety. So how can we get to that culture and how can we as a regulator get to encouraging that culture? So this is not just about how services develop it, but how we as a regulator can develop a culture. Now, the the, the sense about when something goes wrong, not blaming the people involved, but actually helping them learn from that and promote that learning again is very important. And I suppose sometimes we as a regulator are, are, are perceived to be part of the blame culture. And I think that is a concern to me. How can we as a regulator still be an effective regulator, but not be part of driving the blame culture? And I think that is one of the, one of the big challenges for us as an organisation. We need to understand what a safe culture is and we need to be clear about it. Uh, and we're increasingly talking and discussing what a safe culture will look like. And we want to work with with those services that are develop, that develop, delivering safety to make sure we understand it through their eyes and their perception. There may be areas where we want to prioritise and we haven't decided on any priorities yet, but uh, for instance, it, within the NHS, there are national patient safety alerts and we've been working with NHS improvement to make sure those national patient safety alerts are seen as a priority by providers and, are, and that priority is reflected in our regulation. What about other parts of healthcare. What about social care? How do we set priorities in those areas? How do we make sure that people understand the priorities in those areas? For instance, we know that there are enormous numbers of safety uh, of medicine safety errors uh, across the NHS. We have no idea how many there are in social care, um, but there's no reason to think that the, that the safety risks are any different. How do we work across the whole health and social care system to make sure there's a common understanding of safety? I think is one of the things we need to understand. I, one, of, one of the things that's become clear to us recently is that regulation is too complex uh, and we are working with other regulators and other partners to discuss how we can make regulation simpler. Uh, and I think some of that is about sharing information, sharing data, but some of that is about, uh, if you like, working with them so we're aligned in what we do and people and people providing services are not getting mixed messages about what the priorities are. So when we talk about safety as a priority, when we talk about safety culture, we need to influence providers, but we also need to influence other regulators so we're talking the same language with them. Uh, and that, that providers and people using services are getting a consistent message about what uh, uh, safety is and what a good safety culture is and how we can address that. We want to work with providers to identify safety issues uh, uh, and particularly where those safety issues fall as the boundary between different providers. And this comes back to the system integration we're talking about. And this is interesting, One, if you looked at our local system reviews from about two years ago, there was a report on that called Beyond Barriers, which, I, which was very influential in our internal thinking in the CQC and very much is a driver behind this, this strategy, but also I think influential beyond that. I think it increasingly made people understand the importance of systems working together. And one of the elements of that was that the gaps between different parts of the system often had safety uh, uh, consequences. And that while, while an individual provider may be very safe, it may be in the gaps between uh, providers where patients are passing from one pathway to another, from one provider to another, a longer uh, a health or care pathway, 
that the that the safety incidents occur, and because they are not because they're in the boundaries, they perhaps don't get the uh, the uh, 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 understanding or focus they should. One of the uh, one of the things we launched uh, 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 about uh, two years ago now was uh, a policy for healthcare called Learning from Deaths, and one of the one of the items that we we found was really significant there was that if patients didn't die within a provider, their death was often not investigated because they died somewhere else. So if someone died after being discharged home, often the provider didn't look into why they died. And what we said was, it's important people understand that even people who've left your service, it may be important to understand what has happened to them in their care so that we can learn the lessons and improve. And so this moving safety, so it isn't provider specific, but built across systems, I think is increasingly important. And I think the, the penultimate bullet point there is, I think, potentially transformational if we do it well. Uh, and that is, we need to make sure that people who use services are equal partners in safety. And that, by that, I mean, actually, we need to give them the respect of listening to them about safety. Because one of the problems, perhaps, that we have in health and social care is we think about safety in a very narrow way that's focused around our understanding uh, of the services we provide. While the people using services may think about safety in a very different way, and some of that may be about their autonomy as individuals and about you know respect for that, but some of it may just be they see things in a different way and they can see safety risks that we can't see because they are seeing it through the eyes of people using services. And so what we want to, as part of the safety culture we want to encourage, we want to make sure that people who use services are influential in that safety culture, not seen as recipients of the safety culture, but equal partners. So setting safety priorities, how do you involve service users? Understanding safety risks, how do you involve service users? Investigating uh, and learning from, from safety issues, how do you involve service users? Um, they are going to ask the questions that perhaps the professionals won't ask, not because the professionals don't have expertise, but because they just don't have the same view of the world and the same view of safety uh, as people using services. And I think that could, if we, if it's done well, I think that can be potentially transformational. And it's a very central part of what we want to talk about in terms of safety. And it comes back to what I was saying earlier on, that one of the strong themes from this whole strategy is listening to people using services. And also the, the challenge to us is, can we react quickly uh, to protect people if there's safety risks? That is something we're constantly challenging ourselves to do. And we believe as a smarter regulator, we should be able to do that better. And that's going to be a challenge for us in terms of our regulation going forward. So those are lots of comments I've made about safety for you. And I hope, hope they, they have stimulated some thinking for you. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So safety. Uh, these are some of the questions that perhaps we can, I can challenge to you. Do, you. do you agree with some of the things I've said? What are the barriers to a safe culture? Do you see other barriers that perhaps I haven't touched on uh, and that you think we need to focus on? This point about people being partners in their own safety, how can we make it real? Uh, last thing we want to do is to create a kind of tokenistic culture where people are, are, are invited to, to, to get involved in safety. We want this to be real. We want people who are using services to feel real partners in safety where they want to, where they want to. Um, how can we develop our role as a leader in this area? Now, safety uh, clearly means we have to work with other parts of the system because safety is not a purely, uh, 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 we're not the only leaders in this area. And so I've talked about working with other regulators, very important, but how can the CQC develop its role in this area? And what are the drivers the CQC can use to improve safety and promote, uh, promote safe care for people? Are there any key drivers that I haven't mentioned that you think are important? Uh, 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 or is there any way we can use the drivers I have mentioned in, in, in different ways to drive safety? Over to you now, uh, so any questions? Now, I haven't got the chat screen up, so I can't see what there is on it. So can I hand over to one of my colleagues just yeah. to highlight any questions or comments or feedback uh, that there is? That's, that's, that's great. great. Thanks, Ted. Um, just to say uh, to everybody on the call today that everybody will receive this slide pack after after the webinar today and we'll also the recording of this webinar will go onto our website as well. So you don't have to worry about that. 
and um, we've had a lot of queries through um around testing and also the esf and um, we will get back to those individuals um outside of this webinar but we'll stick to the strategy questions today so we've got um a few with uh, that have come through ted so a bit around about the the process the timeline how will providers be able to be involved in the consultation process Okay, well, there are two elements to that. One is the consultations are going on at the moment, so your feedback today is important. And towards the uh, end of this webinar, I'll give you some more details about how you can stay abreast of what we're doing and how you can feed back into that. And there are, of course, more webinars being organised. So very much we want your involvement in that. There will be a formal consultation that comes out in, 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 in over, over the winter months, which, which I mentioned earlier on, and we want as many people to contribute to that as possible. Uh, so, so please do get involved in the consultations going on at the moment. It's very dynamic. We're very interested in your views, but please do respond to the formal consultation as well. That's great. Thanks, Ted. And so we've had one here from Simon Crowther. What's your plan for commissioning bodies? Unless commissioning is brought into the regulation framework, your goals and desires will not be achieved. Well, we want to look at systems and how systems work together. Uh, and it's, so it's very important that, 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 that we, uh, we understand the system dynamics and how they work together. We don't regulate commissioners. Um, so, so you know, we don't regulate commissioners, and 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 uh, uh, for us to regulate commissioners would mean a change in legislation. Uh, but what we want to do is work with commissioning bodies as partners in this. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, the with the development of uh, integrated care systems in, in, in health and social care, there will be a blurring of lines between commissioning and providers. Integrated care systems are, are at present not legal entities, so that we will not register them as such and we'll need to find a way of relating to them. If they become legal entities, then they'll become registrable providers and there'll be an opportunity for us to have a more direct regulatory relationship with them. So I think in answer to your question, we don't have the power to regulate commissioners at the moment. Uh, we have we can report uh, under the Secretary of State's uh, uh, guidance uh, on commissioning on particular circumstances. So the local system reviews that I mentioned earlier on, the Beyond Barriers report was very much about commissioning, but that was we were given powers to do that by the Secretary of State specifically for that review. Without those powers, we can't do, do another report quite like that, although we are looking at how providers work together. But going forward, I think there's a real need for regulation and commissioners to work in partnership, and we're very keen to do that, uh, developing uh, our strategy. I think they're important partners for us, as are the providers themselves. I think there is a there is a real um, sense that if we're going to provide health and care well in these challenging times, we all need to work together. There needs to be collaboration. So we need to respect each other's roles, but be willing to collaborate. And that applies to us as the regulator as much as to the commissioners and the providers. And I think, you know, that is a real challenge for us all because the system can sometimes feel very fragmented. That's great. Thanks, Ted. And um, there are a few likes on this one. So how are you ensuring risk around safety are effectively effectively monitored during this time when homes have closed their doors to the public? Uh, we well, the, the uh, emergency support framework is an opportunity for us to talk to uh, uh, providers and explore how they perceive their risk. As I say, we want to do that in a supportive way uh, and uh, uh, we are very much uh, uh, listening to what they tell us about the challenges for them. But that doesn't mean we're not listening to service users who are raising concerns with us. That doesn't mean we're not listening to uh, 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 members of staff who are raising concerns with us. And that does not mean we're monitoring uh, uh, outcomes uh, where we have access to data on that. So so we are looking at, re at, uh, uh, at safety in the round. We want to support us. Uh, uh, we want to take a supportive view to reflect what I'm saying. But equally, if we identify safety risks in care homes or any other providers, I should say this is not unique to care homes, then we will take we will, if, if necessary, undertake inspections. And at the moment, we are undertaking responsive inspections because risk has been identified in all health and social care sectors. So, so those inspections are going on at the moment, regardless of the of the pandemic. And where necessary, we are taking enforcement action to protect people. So our basic uh, uh, role as a regulator uh, who, that can take enforcement action to protect people has not gone away. But I think our strategy is very much about 
But going beyond that, and it's about smarter regulation to come back to what I said, uh, purely driving safety by enforcement has limit is limited in how it can drive safety. I think we understand over the last few years that enforcement is necessary and important. But if you want to drive really safe care, we have to move beyond enforcement. So we're not going to we're not going to stop doing enforcement where necessary. We're not going to stop intervening where there's unsafe care. And I, we mentioned that in the bullet points. But having said that, if we really want safe care to be delivered consistently, we have to work in collaboration with providers and with people using services uh, to build a really strong safety culture across all health and social care. And that is our ambition. It may sound very ambitious to you, but What's the point in doing this unless we're really ambitious about safety? That's really what I'm challenging myself about. That's great. Thanks, Ted. Um, we've had um, a query further up the chat, so I don't want to miss it. Um, what will you use, for example, what kind of insight to enable smarter regulation and how will this drive the inspection regime? And that's from Rachel Powell Hill. Thank you, Rachel. So, so uh, well, what we will what we will do is, I mean, we want to become much less of an organisation that is constantly demanding information from providers to one that is monitoring in a more sophisticated way. And we're looking very much at, 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 as we build on the emergency support framework to develop technological ways of monitoring what is going on, building in the risks from people who talk to us, people who use services, uh, uh, whistleblowers, uh, but also looking at the data we have about risk identifying the risk factors and becoming more sophisticated identifying risk from our monitoring data. And we can use technology to drive that. And I think it's very clear, and what we've learned from the emergency support framework is there are enormous potential to use technology to drive that and provide us with a much more dynamic view of risk in the system so that we can respond more quickly when there are problems. But equally, we can intervene in a supportive way where that is going to be most effective. And I, I, th this will take a while to develop, but smarter regulation has to be about understanding, having a, a real time view of, of quality and safety rather than the episodic view of quality and safety that comes from just doing uh, inspections according to a timetable, which is what we which is what we've traditionally done. And we have very much have this ambition to have a real time view of quality and safety driven by a technological platform that can mean that when we do intervene, we're intervening in the right places at the right time. That's great. We've had a, a query here from Chris Connell and it's got a few likes. So will you be looking um, to make more explicit use of NICE guidance? Alignment with NICE could help promote a shared view of safety and quality based on evidence. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, uh, this interesting, interesting question, Chris. There is a lot of NICE guidance and uh, 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 what we can't do is go and inspect each service against each piece of NICE guidance. Uh, that would be enormously resource intensive and disruptive to the service. What we need to do is to make sure the services are led uh, in a way that puts the evidence based guidance absolutely at the core of delivering safe care. So this comes back to the culture question I, uh, I talked about. Now, that doesn't mean we won't specifically go in and look at specific bits of nice guidance occasionally. But what we can't do is go and look at all the nice guidance all the time. And, and, and this this also reflects the national patient safety alerts that, that I was talking about uh, when I was speaking. We are now working with NHS Improvement to make sure national patient safety alerts are being issued on a consistent way. And we will be going and inspecting some providers uh, about around specific national patient safety alerts. But fundamentally, we want to make sure the providers have the right culture, the right governance, the right values to make sure that safety alerts are always implemented, uh, not to wait for the CQC to come around and find out they're not and then do something about it. We want to move away from this sense of people are waiting for the CQC to tell them to do something to a sense where the system it, it delivers consistently on safety uh, and evidence based care all the time. Uh, and that is very much about leadership and culture. And that's why we're focusing on that. But that doesn't mean the enforcement area will not still be used. That's great. Thanks, Ted. This one's anonymous, but um, social care often have a blame culture within safeguardings, which is not helpful or supportive. Neither does it help with the lessons learned principle. How do you plan to change this culture from social services? As for providers, this can impact, impact their transparency and openness. 
Absolutely. And uh, well, I, I, I work, I, I'm from medical background and work in hospitals, so I, I don't want to comment too much about social care. But having said that, what you say sounds very typical of what I see in lots of health services as well. And I think this blame culture is very difficult uh, because it, it is part of the system culture. Uh, and, and as I said, to, uh, as I was talking, one of my concerns is how do we stop the CQC being part of the, a driver of the system culture around blame? Let's be clear about this. Blame does not drive safety. Blame drives defensive behaviour that makes things less safe. That's absolutely clear to me and it's abundantly clear for any, any examination of safety cultures. Blame is really destructive of safety. It stops people being open about things they're worried about. And the last thing you want is people not to be open about things they worry about, because actually that is the most important opportunity to learn. So, so I, I don't have a simple answer. And to some extent, that's why I'm asking you on the on, on this slide is how do we as, as a regulator, you know, a regulator that many people will portray as a regulator that blames people when things go wrong, become a regulator that drives a no blame, a just culture, a culture where people feel free to speak up. And people you know, are not worried about talking about safety concerns because they understand it's only about talking about them and being open about them. Will they ever be properly addressed? I think that's a challenge to us and I don't have a simple answer to it, but I think it is one that's very important to us. But we can only do it with the support of other regulators and with the support of the system. And I think that's reflected Ted through the comments as well. So Susan Blacklock um, has posted, it would be more effective compliance process if the providers and CQC work together and to learn from each other without blame. I would welcome this. I, and I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. That doesn't mean we don't have a role. And, you know, and, and this is one of the problems that, 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 that we sometimes have is we, we have a regulatory role. We have to take enforcement action where we see problems uh, that, that need to be addressed. That doesn't mean we're blaming people. We are just doing what our role is and people need to understand and respect our role, but also need to work with us to make that role, if you like, unnecessary. That's great. Have we got time for one more, Steph? Uh, yes, one more. Yeah. So this one comes from Lola. Um, will CQC be looking at developing black, Asian, minority and ethnicity regulations and ensure this is embedded in the inspection framework to promote equality of opportunity, diversity and inclusion and eradicate race inequality and help drive continuous improvement and safe care within the health and social care sector? And that's from Lola. Thank you, Lola. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, I, I mean, I talked about health inequalities and of course one of the things that has come really clear out of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is inequalities uh, around race in terms of outcomes from COVID-19 and understanding why that's happening and what services are doing to protect people against the effect of it. Absolutely, but of course it goes much wider than that. And, and, and I have to say, I think one of the frustrations is there is a lot of talk about health inequalities in lots of parts of the system, but actually uh, we are not seeing much change in that and I think it's absolutely fundamental we as a regulator need to focus on that area and we will build it, building all aspects of health inequalities including uh, race equality into our inspection process going forward. We already take very very strong note of workforce race equality in the NHS as part of our well-led inspections and we'll continue to do so. So we very much want to be a real major driver of equality uh, across the health and social care service system. So Lola, yes, thanks for, this, thanks for the question and it's very much going to be part of our future plans. Okay, uh, is, is that uh, all questions done then? So we've got another we've got five minutes at the end, Ted, for some more questions, um, but I think we've just got a couple more slides before then. Okay, fine. So let, let me, this slide is about, and it comes back to a theme that I've touched on several times during this uh, uh, this webinar and that is about people using services and uh, and in terms of safety I think as I said I think if we can involve people really really involve people as equal partners in using services then I think that can be transformational in safety and I strongly think that that is the way forward it's not going to be easy because it's not the expectation of the system it's not necessarily the expectation of service users but actually there's a lot of wisdom out there amongst the people using services they can challenge our thinking they can challenge our group think and make us think differently but equally we need to understand 
from people from people's perspective about how the services work for them and it's really central to our thinking going forward is how do we build uh, our, our, our regulation through the eyes of people using services so this comes back to safety as i just mentioned but equally comes back to the issues about systems and how do systems create care around people using services it comes back to what i was just talking about with lola about how people uh, get consistent care regardless of uh, you know their backgrounds whatever they may be and making sure that people are health inequalities are being addressed effectively and i think you know this this is this is a real opportunity and so so i think putting people at the heart of what we do is going to be very much the center of this and 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 i strongly i think you know clearly there has to be a partnership with the people using services but also with the providers and understanding how providers can put people who are using services at the heart of understanding their quality and safety and i think that's that's an opportunity for us all so a very important part of what we're doing uh, next slide please okay so uh, Earlier on, someone was asking about how could they get involved. Probably the most easiest way to get involved is our digital platform, and you can see the uh, the uh, 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 web address there in terms of this. And this is an opportunity to to comment on a much more frequent basis on our developing strategy, and it is important to us. So please, if you haven't, uh, log into our, 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 our citizen lab platform and get involved in our developing strategy development. As, as I hope I've suggested to you today, there is a lot to discuss and we are very keen on hearing your views. There will also be opportunities in the regular provider bulletins that come out on a regular basis, twice a month. Uh, they've had a strong COVID-19 focus, inevitably, over the last few months, but equally there'll be opportunities to understand uh, op uh, further uh, uh, chances to, to, to get involved in our, in our uh, strategy development. So that is important. And then, of course, uh, you can follow us on the CQC Twitter account and that will have latest information about uh, our plans and developments and opportunities to get involved. So please do get involved in all those. Please stay with us and contribute. It, our strategy will only be better with your comments and feedback. So it is important for us that we hear all views on this uh, and make sure that we take into account everyone's perspective on the way forward. So thank you for that. Next slide, please. OK, so we have, I think, uh, uh, seven or eight minutes to go. Uh, so there are opportunities for a few final questions uh, on the strategy uh, or anything else you want to develop. So over to you again. Um, so there's a there's a few that have come through that I just want to um, we'll take three because they've got the most the most likes. This is more of a discussion point. Um, but this is Rachel Frost from Bees Care Agency in Medway. So she's um, put a post about barriers to safe culture. She's put, there are so many times that NHS social services do not provide enough information or the correct information to providers when handling the individual into their care. This can increase workload for providers, their staff, and also affect the quality of care that is provided at the time. There seems to be no set format that this is used across the board. And that's from Rachel. Well, Rachel, that's a good point, and I think I, I, I would support that. It, it is often people being transferred for different parts of the system where risks really occur. And one of the key elements of that is the handover of, of information. And it is strange, isn't it, that um, that so many systems have multiple different information systems that don't talk to one another. And as integrated systems develop, one of the key elements that is going to drive that is an integrated information system so that, you know, there's no area where people information about individual patients, their care, their care plan uh, or, or their needs are lost between different providers. So I think that's a real challenge. It has a safety risk, but it also has a risk about the quality of care overall. And I think I, I think that is a real challenge. So yes, safety isn't just about safety in individual providers. This is also about how providers work with one another, transfer information uh, to make sure that patients get consistent care as they move through the system. That's great, thank you. This one has got the most likes um, on the webinar today. So will the Chloe's change as a result of the revised strategy? Uh, so the Chloe's are not going to change in the immediate future because we need to go out to consultation to change the Chloe's. Uh, we will be going out to consultation probably early in the new year, uh, early in 2021, on our inspection methodology and our assessment framework. Uh, that will be building on what we've learned from COVID-19. 
it'll be streamlined approach because uh, in these in these times when COVID-19 is prevalent, we want to make sure that we are fleet of foot, as I said earlier on, and not adding to the risks in the system. So we do need to go out to consultation about that in the new year. That will take into account our strategic direction. In terms of will the close change? Well, I can't preempt that at the moment because we haven't made that decision. We are working on it uh, and we we'll want to consult on it. I think broadly the Chloe's won't change radically. We may want to streamline them a bit in order, <coughs> in order to make sure that our inspection methodology and our assessment framework is as efficient, as effective and focused as possible. Uh, but I do, uh, my, my sense at the moment is they will not change radically. <coughs> Excuse me. Great, thanks Ted. Um, another one with a lot of likes here. The standards and expectations vary widely from inspector to inspector. How will CQC ensure monitoring expectations and regulation is standard across the board? And that was uh, good, good, challenge, good, good challenge and I think it's important. Uh, I mean clearly a lot of this is about uh, uh, our inspectors. I mean we want our inspectors not to be tick box inspectors, we want them to use their own professional judgment. A lot of them are very, very experienced and skilled in what they do. But equally, consistency is a constant challenge and technology, I think, will help us help us improve that cons consistency uh, to a great extent by creating technological platforms to drive assessments and inspections. But this is never going to be just a tick box exercise. We will inspect, uh, expect our inspectors to use professional judgment and to focus where they feel focus is necessary in individual providers. But let's just come back to what I was saying about smarter regulation. Um, in the, at the end, if inspection drives everything we do in regulation, then we're not in smarter regulation territory. And I think we would like to build up our understanding of the quality of care in, 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 in providers with by that relationship with providers and use inspection purely as a backup to that rather than as a central driver. So in a sense, this is about the CQC moving on from being an inspectorate to being a much uh, smarter regulator. That doesn't mean we'll stop inspecting, we will inspect, but it will not be the primary driver of our assessment of services going forward, we hope. That's great. I'll just read out one more and then I think we'll have to close for today. But just to say to everybody that we have captured all of this information and it is all going to help to feed and shape our strategy as we develop it. Um, so this is from Marie Patterson. Um, will you be sharing best practice in regard to supporting service users to have a voice or how we can capture the views of service users experiences of services? Uh, well, I, I, I think we should because we want to promote that and uh, uh, clearly we need to learn what best practice is uh, and promote that. But I think one of our jobs in driving improvement is to identify and celebrate uh, services that are doing aspects of care really well. Uh, and, you know, if we really believe that that's this involvement of service users uh, 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 is really transformational, then we want to see it done really well. So we'll be looking for opportunities for that and certainly we'll want to seek to 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 uh, uh, to celebrate and publicise best practice where we find it. That's great. Thanks, Ted. I think we'll close there on, on questions. OK, well, in which case, uh, thank you. Thank you for my colleagues at CQC for their support uh, uh, and thank you everyone who's joined the uh, 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 webinar. I hope it's been interesting to you. I hope it's been stimulating uh, and I hope you've got some sense about where we're going, but also uh, some sense about how you can influence where we're going. Because as I say, nothing is set in stone yet. Uh, we'll be going out for formal consultation later and we're very much interested in your continuing views. So please do keep, stay involved and feedback as needed. And I look forward to working with many of you as we go forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>